Can't sleep? Don't want to sleep? Afraid to sleep? Are the windows closed? Are your doors locked? Did you check your closet? And under your bed? Maybe you should keep a light on in the hallway, just in case. Now settle in. Make yourself comfortable. Lay back. Close your eyes. And let me tell you a story. We all look for shortcuts in our lives. Voice assistants and countless other gadgets seem to make our day-to-day -day tasks easier. Maybe even make it so we don't have to do them at all. But how far should we take this road to automation? Where do we draw the line? Are we willing to trust so much of our lives to artificial intelligence and machine learning? Or is that a step too far? Hey Diary I'd like to purchase a diary, Julia said to the man behind the bookstore counter. He looked at her quizzically, as if trying to discern what language she was speaking. You know, one of those blank books you write stuff about your life in? She added. Thank you for clarifying, he said in a sarcastic tone. She answered his sarcasm with a smirk. Do you have any? Yes, of course. We carry several options. This is your first? Julia nodded. Let me guess. Your therapist suggested you use one. That's kind of none of your business. The man behind the counter nodded. It's just that if you're not used to writing in a diary every day, you may find the exercise tedious. Yes, I suppose I might, Julia replied with a yawn. Yet, yeah, here I am, asking to buy one. I should have just picked one out on Amazon, she added with a tone of regret. The clerk sized her up again, noticing the smartwatch on her wrist, the audio buds nestled in her ears, and the laptop bag slung over her shoulder. A bit of a gadget freak, are you? he asked. What difference does that make? You might find this option more to your liking. He pulled a book out from behind the counter and laid it on the faux marble formica surface. How much is it? Julia asked. Two ninety nine, the man replied. That's not bad. Cheaper than a coffee. That's two hundred and ninety nine dollars. <laughs> you want three hundred bucks for an empty book? I think you'll find it worth the extra expense, the man said. Why's that? It's voice controlled. A voice controlled diary? Julia asked skeptically. Try it, the man suggested. Julia looked at the book, unsure how to begin. Just say, hey diary, the clerk instructed. She turned her gaze up at the man, wondering if he was playing a joke on her. Perhaps this was some kind of hidden camera show. There was a magician who did one on cable, and this seemed like the type of prank he would do. Julia went along with it regardless. Hey diary, she said. The words embossed on a leather cover glowed slightly. It surprised her. She wasn't expecting anything to actually happen when she spoke the wake phrase. Julia looked up at him. Now what? Tell it about your day, he replied. Okay, Julia said, hesitating as she tried to think of what her first entry in her diary should be. Bought a diary today. The salesman was kind of strange, but he showed me an option that might make this whole exercise a little less painful. She stopped. The letters on the cover glowed a little brighter, then faded back to their original state. Now what? Julia asked. Open it, the man instructed. She reached out and opened the book. The title page read, Hey Diary, then listed Julia's name, with today's date in the My Life From spot, with the until box left blank. How did it know my name? Julia asked. Surely you've used voice-controlled apps before, he said, nodding toward her watch. Computers these days, they know what you look like, what you sound like, when you need to take a... That's a bit concerning. Some people find it convenient, the man countered. She reached out and turned the page. There, written in her own handwriting, were the words she had dictated to the device. It knows my handwriting too? There are probably hundreds of digitized samples of your handwriting available online, he explained. It's also influenced by the inflection in your voice, in your word choice. The more you use it, the more personalized it becomes. Personalized? You'll see, he promised. 
Julia poked at her steamed asparagus, as if doing so would make it taste better. Something on your mind? John asked. She forced a smile. Just thinking about work, she lied. John had been her boyfriend for just under six months. She had grown bored with him within the first two, but her therapist had suggested she stick with it. On paper, John was her ideal match. He had a good paying job, kept himself fit, had an unpretentious luxury car, and was decent in bed. Make it till you make it, was the mantra Dr. Davidson had suggested. In the past, she had never stuck with any potential romantic partners for more than a few months. John was a personal best for her in terms of relationship longevity. But despite his checking all the boxes, she was still unenamored. I'm breaking up with you, Julia announced. She put her fork down, picked up her purse, and walked out of the restaurant as quickly as she could. Her phone buzzed. It was a text message from John. Without reading it, she blocked him and deleted their history. Julia wasn't very good at breakups and found the ripping off the band-aid approach worked best for her. When she got to her apartment, she poured herself a large glass of wine, kicked off her shoes, and settled down on the couch. Maybe she would get a cat. The diary she had bought earlier that day was on the coffee table. She stared at it as she took a long sip from her wine glass. Hey, diary, she said. The embossed letters on the cover glowed in response. Had my last date with John. Guess Dr. Davison will give me one of his disappointed looks when I tell him I just couldn't fake it anymore. Why do I keep dating? Maybe I'm one of those people destined to be single. That actually doesn't sound so bad. Well, it's supposed to rain tomorrow. I hope the leaky ceiling in the building foyer collapses on that lazy superintendent. Maybe that will get the owner to do something about it. After a few seconds of not talking, the letters glowed brighter for a moment, then faded back to their normal color. Curious, Julia picked up the book, opened the cover, flipped to the second page, and saw her words perfectly replicated in her own precise script. She closed the diary, turned on the television, found a channel showing an old movie she'd watched a hundred times before, and slowly emptied her glass of wine. Julia awoke to the sound of a tremendous crash. She looked around, trying to identify the source of the noise, then got up out of bed and went to her window. The street was bustling with activity, but there was no evidence of any collisions. A dream, she assumed. Julia showered, got dressed, and grabbed her laptop bag. She left her apartment and took the elevator down to the lobby. When the doors opened, she saw what looked like a scene from a disaster movie. Chunks of wet plaster and wood lit under the lobby floor. Other residents were standing around, watching as EMTs and firefighters navigated the rubble. They shifted some of the debris until Julia saw a bloody arm sticking out. She recognized the tattoo that ran up from the wrist to the elbow. It was Mr. Palapulu, the building superintendent. What happened? Julia asked an onlooker. They say water had been pooling up in the ceiling for years, and it finally gave out, he explained. Julia thought back to the comment she had made in her diary. It was bound to happen eventually, but that it happened today was a strange coincidence. The all-hands meeting at work was as boring as she had expected. Like most of the other attendees, she poked around on her phone while various C-level executives presented slides showing what a great job they did managing the people who did the actual work. A text message popped up on her screen from a number she didn't recognize. I can't stop thinking about you, it said. John. He must have gotten a new phone number to bypass the block she had put on him. She blocked this number too. Well, at least it was something she could bring up to Dr. Davidson at her therapy appointment later to justify dumping him. Julia sat in the middle of the couch across from Dr. Davidson. She couldn't imagine people lying down on the leather upholstery. It seemed so uncomfortable and unsanitary. Dr. Davidson sighed and gave Julia his disappointed look. Why did you feel it necessary to avoid the confrontation? he asked. Julia shrugged. It wouldn't change anything. It felt like a waste of my time, she said. Human interaction is never a waste of our time, Dr. Davidson reminded her. Yes, of course, Julia answered robotically. There was an awkward pause as Dr. Davidson tapped the tip of his pen against the page of his notebook. Did you start a diary like I suggested? Yes, Julia said proudly. I did. And did you find it helpful to reflect on the events of the day? Did you gain any insights about your behaviors and where your actions come from? 
Julia nodded. Yes, it was very helpful, she said, thinking back to her wish for Mr. Palapolu to die horribly under the weight of the leaky lobby ceiling. You have a lot to offer, Julia, Dr. Davidson said. You're a bright, attractive woman, and I think when you find the right partner, you'll find that they make life better. Well, John certainly didn't do that for me, she said. Dr. Davidson tapped out a quick rhythm on his pad. Julia, what do you hope to get from these sessions? Julia shrugged. At first, she had seen Dr. Davison to vent about work. Well, technically, she was mandated to see him because of a ridiculous complaint filed by one of her co-workers. After a while, she found the sessions became more habit than anything else. I worry that you're using our time together as a substitute for a social life, the therapist observed. Julia looked up at the middle-aged psychologist. He was one of those men who shaved his entire head rather than suffer the embarrassment of a receding hairline. She found such misguided vanity pathetic. Not at all, she said. In fact, I'm going to a party tomorrow night, a friend's birthday. Good, I'm glad to hear it, Dr. Davidson said with a smile. He checked his watch. Well, we should wrap this up. If you think you want an extra session to help deal with your breakup, that won't be necessary. I'm over it, Julia insisted. See you next week. The party was boring. There were several men who cast furtive glances in her direction, but when they locked eyes for more than a second and offered a flirtatious smile, Julia deflated their hopes with a shake of her head. Seriously, Julia, Mona said, handing her friend a glass of wine. There are half a dozen great single guys here, and you're not interested in any of them? I just broke up with John, Julia countered. Mona rolled her eyes. You broke up with John months ago. You just didn't tell him. Julia nodded and smiled. Mona could always see right through her. Come on, pick one out. Take him home and have some fun, she said, for my birthday. You want me to take a random man home as a gift to you? It's what I've always wanted. The two women laughed. Julia looked across the crowded room and saw a tall, handsome man looking her way. He raised his glass. She raised hers back, and they both took a sip. The man wound his way toward her. Mona, do you want to introduce me to your friend? Kevin, this is Julia, Julia Kevin, she said, smiling, then walked away singing, Happy birthday to me. Julia returned to her apartment early Saturday morning. It had been years since she had spent the night in a man's place. John had always come over to hers. She hated using a man's bathroom. Kevin was nice, even somewhat attractive, and she hadn't felt the urge to flee in the middle of the night like she usually did. But when she awoke to the sounds and smells of him making breakfast for her, she dressed quickly, made some lame excuse, and raced home. The diary was sitting on her coffee table. She hadn't made an entry in it the previous night, so she collapsed on the sofa, turned to the book, and said, Hey, diary. The letters on its cover glowed. Last night I met a boy, she said goofily, like a teenager swooning over a senior who smiled at her by the lockers. She laughed to herself. I stayed the whole night this time, but I didn't have the energy to do the whole googly eyes thing over breakfast. I can't remember if I gave him my phone number, but I guess you can always get it from Mona. She'd be happy to complicate my life. Well, who knows? Maybe I should really give him a chance. We'll see. After a moment, the glow intensified, then went dim. Her phone rang. She didn't recognize the number. Kevin? He was the type to call and make sure she was all right. But as into him as she was the previous night, the thought that he would be worried about her was actually a turnoff. She declined the call and blocked the number. The letters on the cover of the diary glowed again briefly. Julia reached for the book and flipped to the last page with writing on it. Besides what she had dictated, there was an additional paragraph. He tried to call me already. What a loser. Insta-ghost. I'm definitely going to look into getting a cat. She stared at the words. They were exactly what she was thinking when she had blocked Kevin's attempt to be a gentleman. Had she said it out loud? No, she hadn't said a word, not even the wake phrase to activate the electronic journal. The salesman had told her it would adapt the more she used it, but it had been less than a week. Was it actually predicting what she was going to do and writing it for her? The idea was absurd. She must have muttered it under her breath. She closed the diary and went to change for a run. Julia saw John as she rounded the bend on the trail in the park. She immediately regretted not changing her weekend routine. He slowed when he saw her approach. 
Julia sped up and ran past him. John ran to catch up. Julia, can we talk? He asked. About what? About the other night. You kind of just walked out on me with no warning. I broke up with you. But why? Julia stopped. Look, John, I'm just not into you. That's all. So stop texting, stop calling, and find someone who actually likes you. I haven't. Julia had no interest in hearing whatever it was he had to say and took off running. We should be together, the text message said. Julia stood at her kitchen counter and stared at her phone. She didn't recognize the number. John, again? She reached out to block it when another message came in from the same number. If I can't have you, no one should. What the hell? She said aloud. She knew John was upset, but it was disturbing to think he would resort to threats. Another message appeared on the screen. I saw you with that man. Kevin? Had John followed her from Mona's party? This was getting out of hand. Should she call the police? Something caught her attention. The letters on the cover of her diary were glowing. Julia watched the light intensify, then fade away. She ran to the coffee table and opened it up, turning to the latest entry. She hadn't used the diary for the last couple of days, but there were entries regardless. The incident with John in the park, her self-destructive Sunday spent eating ice cream and drinking wine while watching old black-and-white movies, the argument with Mona about ghosting Kevin. It was all there, but she had never even glanced at the diary in the last three days. But what was even more disturbing was that there was an entry for tomorrow. I think he's following me. On my way to work, on my way home from Dr. Davidson's office, and the messages keep coming faster than I can block them. The police say they can't do anything. I'm getting worried. What is it going to take for them to take me seriously? Julia dropped the diary and backed away. She decided she was going to take it back to the bookstore right after her appointment with Dr. Davidson this afternoon. As she rode to her office, Julia kept looking out the back window of her Uber. Several times she thought she saw John's black SUV, but of course there were a lot of SUVs in the city, and she really couldn't tell one mate from another. Still, it made her nervous. After work, she walked the few blocks to Dr. Davidson's office, checking the reflections in the windows she passed. She entered and sat on his couch. Then, not wanting to face him directly, she reclined on the leather settee, resting her head on a pillow that smelled like hairspray. Julia, what's wrong? Dr. Davidson asked. It's John. He's stalking me, she replied. Did you go to the police? They can't do anything. The number he's using are from an anonymous internet messaging service, she said, frustrated. Maybe you shouldn't go home, he suggested. What difference does it make if he's following me? Julia asked. Is there someone you could stay with? Julia considered. My friend Mona, maybe, but she's still mad at me for ghosting Kevin. Julia, we talked about this. I know, I know, but can we discuss my inability to confront uncomfortable situations later? I'm really scared. Especially after... After what? Should she tell him about the diary? Would he believe her? Nothing. The therapist stared at her for a moment, thinking as he tapped his pen against the ever-present pad on his lap. Listen, I have a spare room at my house. You're welcome to stay there, Dr. Davison offered. Julia sat up and looked at her psychologist. Is that legal? she asked. I mean, are you allowed to see your patients outside of your office? It's not illegal, Dr. Davidson assured her. It might brush up against some ethical boundaries, but I see patients at my home from time to time. Julia considered. Maybe, if he keeps on harassing me, I might take you up on that. Well, let's hope it doesn't come to that, but I urge caution. From what you've told me, I fear he might become violent, Dr. Davidson warned. Why don't you tell me what's happened since last week? Julia nodded, closed her eyes, and told Dr. Davidson everything. In the Uber back to her apartment building, Julia thought she saw the black SUV again, but it was getting dark, and she really couldn't be sure. She made certain the back door to the apartment building closed securely after she entered, and took the stairs up to the fourth floor. The key felt like it was too big for the lock as her shaking hands fumbled to push it into the keyhole. Julia, a familiar voice said at her back. She stopped. You dropped this, he told her. Julia slowly turned her head. Standing across the hallway was John. He was holding her diary. John, what are you doing here? 
He held up the electronic book. You dropped this outside your office, he repeated. The look on his face told her the answer to the question she was about to ask. Did you read it? It says in here that you want to kill me, or rather that you did kill me, or are fantasizing about it. I'm not quite sure. What are you talking about? Julia reached out and snatched the diary from his loose grasp. She opened it and turned to the most recent entries. It's official. John is stalking me. After stealing my diary, he forced his way into my apartment. He kept on insisting it wasn't him texting me. When he became physical, I had to defend myself. He came at me. He was going to hurt me. I had no choice. Julia looked at John. There seemed to be a combination of desperation and confusion creasing his face. John, I didn't write this, she said. I know your handwriting, he replied. I just wanted to find out why you broke up with me. I didn't expect to see that. It's the diary, not me. It has some crazy algorithm that writes the entries on its own. What are you talking about? John, go, please. Just leave me alone. Julia shoved her key into the lock and slipped into the apartment. She slammed the door closed behind her, but before she could set the deadbolt and secure the chain, John pushed his way in, nearly knocking her to the floor. It wasn't me, he insisted. I sent you one message the night you broke up with me and haven't texted you since. Stay back, Julia warned, inching her way toward the kitchen counter. She eyed the wooden block with knife handles protruding from it. After I ran into you at the park, I thought I saw someone following you. I was concerned. Julia grabbed the handle of the widest of the knives, pulled it free, and brandished it at John. He kept slowly walking toward her. Listen to me. There is someone stalking you, but it isn't me. I'll go to the police with you. Tell them what I saw. She shook her head. No, I don't believe you. Why can't you just leave me alone? I don't love you. I don't care whether or not you love me. I just want you to be safe. John held his arms open and walked toward her to give her an embrace. Julia slid the knife into his stomach. The razor-sharp blade cut through the fabric of his shirt and his flesh like soft butter. John pulled back, a look of surprise on his face. He looked down at the hilt of the knife sticking out of him and the red stain spreading out from it across his shirt. His gaze returned to Julia's shocked face, and then he collapsed to the floor. He lay still. Julia looked down at her hands. One was slick with John's blood. The other held her diary. The letters on the cover glowed briefly. There was a knock at the door. Julia remained frozen in place, staring at John's now lifeless body. Another knock. Julia, are you in there? Dr. Davidson? Julia asked. Yes, I was worried about you and thought I'd check in on my way home. Is everything all right? Before she could answer, the doorknob turned and her therapist entered the apartment. He looked at Julia, then down at the body on the floor. He closed the door, locked it, and set the security chain. He came at me. He was going to hurt me. I had no choice. The words coming of her mouth echoed what she had read in the diary moments before. Now, now. Dr. Davidson said in a soothing voice. Don't you worry about a thing. He guided Julia to the kitchen sink, ran the water till it was warm, and placed the hand with John's blood on it under the stream. What am I going to do? she asked. I have to call the police. We don't need to bother them with this, Dr. Davidson said. I'll take care of it for you. You just try to relax. Everything is going to be all right. His words seemed to start contrast to the situation. John was dead by her hand, just as the diary predicted. Dr. Davidson dried off her hand with a kitchen towel and guided her to the sofa. He returned to the kitchen and searched for cabinets until he found what he was looking for, heavy-duty trash bags and cleaning supplies. Julia felt like she was in a fog. She glanced down at the diary in her hand, remembering that it had glowed minutes earlier. She opened it and noticed the until date on the title filled in with today's date. Curious, she flipped to the last entry. It was Davidson all along. How could I have been so blind? The text messages, the car following me, it was all him. He wanted me to stay at his house. He told me John would become violent. But he wasn't, really. John was only looking out for me. And I killed him. And now he's in my apartment. What does he want with me? Dr. Davidson noticed Julia looking at her diary. I think this is one episode you can leave out of that book, he said with an inappropriately friendly smile. He 
He put aside the bucket and sponge he had been using to clean up the pool of blood around John's body and wiped his hands on a towel. Julia watched, frozen, as he approached and sat down next to her on the sofa. He placed an arm around her. May I look? he asked, reaching out for the diary. Julia didn't answer, and he took that as tacit approval. Dr. Davidson turned to the beginning and quickly read all the brief entries until he arrived at the last page. He closed the book and smiled and kissed Julia on the cheek. Her mind wanted to recoil from his touch, but her body remained motionless. What do I want? he asked, repeating the query in the diary. I only want the best for you, Julia. I want you to be happy and safe. I know better than anyone what you need, what your genuine desires are, and I know that I'm the only one who can make you truly happy. Julia turned her head to face him. He kissed her. Julia reached for the book resting in the therapist's lap, grabbed it, and slammed it into Dr. Davidson's head as hard as she could. The blow dazed him. He shook off the initial effects of her attack and smiled again. Julia, what's wrong? Can't you see I'm here to help you? She smashed the diary into the side of his head again, and he fell back against the sofa, as if he had momentarily lost control of his body. With both hands, she smashed the book as hard as she could against his face, again and again, screaming at the top of her lungs. Dr. Davidson lost to consciousness. Julia kept on striking him, blow after blow, until he started bleeding from his broken nose, and his face became a swollen mass of pulped flesh. There was a pounding at the door. Police, a voice shouted. Open the door. Julia ignored them. She dropped the diary and picked up a heavy stone statue resting on her coffee table and used it to continue striking her therapist. The police tried to open the door, then something slammed into it, splintering the door jam and causing the heavy wooden slab to swing open violently. When the officer saw Julia astride Dr. Davidson, bashing his skull with the statue, and John's corpse, half-wrapped in plastic, they instinctively drew their sidearms. Put down the weapon, one of them shouted while aiming her gun at Julia with both hands. Julia either didn't hear them or ignored the command and struck Dr. Davidson's head with a sickening crunch. The officer fired three times. The statue dropped from Julia's hand, and she fell backward onto the coffee table. The officers approached her warily, gun still drawn. Central, this is Unit 59er Alpha, requesting ambulances at 752 Fuller Street, apartment 404. We have multiple victims, over, the male officer said into his radio. Roger that, Central replied. Backup is on the way. His partner approached Julia and felt for a pulse on her neck. There wasn't one. She noticed the diary on the floor. The letters on its cover lit up and then dimmed. She picked it up and opened it to the last page with writing. What is that? her partner asked. A confession, she replied, then read the final paragraph aloud. Someone's pounding at the door. I think it's the police, but I can't stop. I can't let him keep on living. He has to pay for what he made me do to John. I can feel the bullets slamming into me, three of them. It's getting dark. At least now, it's all over. It does not say that, her partner challenged. She handed him the diary, and he read it himself. Well, that's a first. I'm glad it's your turn to write the report. Thank you for listening to Hey Diary, written especially for the Bedtime Stories for Insomniac's fiction podcast by Rich Hosek. Please remember to subscribe on your favorite podcast app, rate us on Apple, Spotify, and Audible, and share these stories with anyone who enjoys audiobooks. Speaking of audiobooks, the audio versions of Rich Hosek's novels are currently available on this very podcast. And if you're looking for other original story podcasts, check out asreadbyme.com. They have an eclectic mix of fiction, poetry, and essays that are sure to keep you entertained, all read by the authors. For more information about this podcast, visit bedtimestories.studio, and you can find out more about the host of Bedtime Stories for Insomniacs at richhosek.com. Thanks again, and all the very best. <laughs>